glasses stand around Well, their shawls all pulled around them And the salt tears running down Well, don't you weep, me bonnie lass Though you'll be left behind For the rose will grow on Greenland's ice Before we change our minds And it's cheer up, me lads let your heart never fail, for the bonny ship that I'm in goes fishing for the whale. Here's a health to the resolution, likewise the Eliza Swan. Three cheers for the battler of Montrose and the diamond ship of fame. We wear the trousers of the white, the jackets of the blue. And when we're back in Peterhead, we'll have sweethearts anew. And it's cheer up me, lad. Let your heart never fail for the bonny ship that I've been goes fishing for the whale. Well, it'll be bright both day and night when the Greenland lads come home. We're the ship full up with oil, me boys, and money to our names. We'll make the cradles for to rock, the blankets for to tear, and never in Latin Peterhead sings Harsha by my dear. And it's cheer up, me lads. Let your heart never fail for the body ship that I in goes fishing for the whale. And it's cheer up, me lads. Let your heart never fail for the body ship that I in goes fishing for the whale. Thank you guys very much. So I uh, turn it over to the crew in the boat to tell you more about the hunt for the whale and all that's involved. Dave? Thank you, Barry. <laughs> well, the hunt for the whale actually would have begun on the mothership itself, like the Charles W. Morgan. She had three masts, and those two forward masts, the four masts and the main masts, way up high above the deck, about 90 feet or so, there were the cross trees and the hoops. And the men would be spending a two-hour watch up there, so you'd have four men aloft, scanning the horizon for any sign of whale. And from high aloft there, you would hear that familiar cry of, there she blows, or I see flukes, or there she breaches. And at that point, the officer on duty, the first through fifth mate, or in the early days, even the captain, would have started a conversation with that man aloft. The first question he'd probably ask is, where away? In other words, using a compass direction point nomenclature, he would say two points off the starboard bow, perhaps, or two points off the port bow, so that perhaps that officer could get a gander at what this man was seeing. The second question he would ask is, what kind and how many? The how many is pretty self-explanatory. The Morgan had the ability to launch between one and five boats. But the more important question was, what kind? We do know that the American whale fishery, they went after a number of different species of whale, but they primarily focused on three. The bowhead whale, the right whale, and the sperm whale. The reason being, first and foremost, they don't swim all that quickly. So they were easily caught in a boat like this. The more important aspect is that generally when they die, they float. And when you're in a 26 to 30 foot boat, you only have 1,800 foot of line. A 40 to 50 ton anchor is not something you want to attach yourself to. <laughs> so let's say uh, the last question would be actually how far off so they could gauge how many miles away those whale, that whale or those whales were. And then the order would be given to man and lower one to five boats. As these boats are taking the surface, off water of the main vessel, being held there by a block of water known as the falls. And the man in my position, I'm representing the harpooner or boat steerer, and the person represented by uh, Sarah Aft there would be one of the officers. They would actually be lowered to the boat to the water. Once they got into the water, they would go ahead and disconnect that block and back to the water known as the falls, and take a high hook for a half, and they would lay all their weight onto those falls. The rest of the crew is going to have to slide down those falls, and they want them nice and tight. And there's a bit of organized chaos, because the boat isn't hanging as you see here. It actually has all of its gear jumbled in the center of the craft. And so just like we did, they would spend their time getting the forest cross and everything into position where you see it now. And then, me including myself, everybody in this boat would take up their oar, except for the <coughs> boat header aft, and that boat header being the officer would be the only one that could actually see the whale or whale. Probably a good thing for those that had to see one.
one before, because they might not grow with such bigger schedule. <laughs> they but what they wanted to do, they didn't just want to get close to that whale. They actually wanted to feed this boat up onto the back of the whale. The call was white cedar to black skin. That's what they wanted to see. And when they got to that position, the officer would give the order to stand up and get it to us. In which case, the man in my position would cross the board like you see here, and he would pick up what we commonly refer nowadays as the harpoon. They would have called it an iron or a harping iron. Now here you see a pretty primitive form of the iron. This is a double blue harping iron. And it's supposed to work like a fish hook. It's actually supposed to attach this boat. It's not supposed to kill the whale. It's supposed to attach this boat to the whale. The line that you see that is bent on here is actually coming out of those two tubs of whale line, going around the only friction point the loggerhead at, over the top of all of the other boards, under the kicking strap, and through the front chop. Now, because of the shape and dynamic of this, this uh, harpoon tip, it didn't work all that well. Some of the numbers thrown around are maybe one in seven, one in eight whales would be attached to using this. Because it has such pointed bars, it pulls out relatively easily. It made a very large hole on the way in and just as large a hole on the way out. In 1848, an African-American shipsman working out from Bedford perfected, perfected a tip that was to revolutionize the industry. You can see right off the bat it has half the profile of the double blue iron, and its outermost bar is actually curved opposite to the way of the for forward bar. You can imagine this would stick a little bit better on its own, but it had this wonderful ability to toggle as it was pulled out. And you can imagine this would lock in quite a bit easier. Now our research here at the Mystic Seaport shows the whales didn't particularly like that. <laughs> So they would do one of three things. If you believe everything you've seen in maritime art, they immediately turned around, smashed this boat to Smithereen, and killed everybody aboard. <laughs> it would not have been a very lucrative venture if that happened every time. It did happen occasionally, but not all that often. What generally happened is perhaps they would sound. In other words, they would swim straight down. We know now that actually a male bull sperm whale can go down to 10,000 feet deep and stay down there for two and a half hours while it's running swift. With 1,800 foot of line, you're going to run out of line very quickly. So you have an option. If there's another boat in the area, you can bend onto that boat's line and double your amount of line that you have. They would not actually get uh, cut loose of this uh, well until the boat was literally, literally a sub submarine. So they would take out what we jokingly refer to as a crisis management tool. <laughs> and when the boat was under underwater and the order was given only by the officer, they would sever their relationship with that whale using this. But more often than not, what they would do is when they got to the end of the line, they would tie on a drogue or a drag. If any of you have seen the movie Jaws, you would have seen them try to tie a drogue or a drag onto the, the shark trying to tire it out. And that was the whole idea, was to tire this whale out. And believe it or not, that drogue creates as much friction in the water as this entire boat, because this boat's made to cut through the water. But usually what they did is they took off in bursts of speed up to 20 miles an hour. Pulling this boat, because they're an air-breathing mammal, they would stay on the surface. And they would take this boat on what was known as the sleigh ride, or the Nantucket sleigh ride. During that, there was a lot of other activity in the boat. So what I'm going to do now is turn you over to the rest of the crew. We're going to tell you about their positions and their duties.